So I should start out with a bit of a reminder on power dissipated in circuit. So let me do that. Power dissipated in circuit. I think uh, a lot of this is going to be a reminder back to, is it chapter 10 or chapter 9? Whichever chapter talk, introduced Ohm's law that uh, uh, basically, uh, th that's what I want to remind you of. So the simplest possible circuit that's not, uh, that does something interesting is a battery register circuit. So you have some voltage source that's uh, hooked up to a load or a motor, um, what I'm calling load, as a something draws current and uh, something that does something interesting in the circuit. And I guess I'm using the term load because it reminds you of like a load you carry. And uh, that's kind of in this, the, that sense in which it, uh, uh, um, th that's the role that it fills in a circuit. If you are imagining not connecting this load, then the battery does nothing. It's not outputting any current. It, it's not doing anything. Once you connect to this load, then the battery is doing something. It is outputting current and there's a power that the battery has to put out that's uh, associated with this current. That's where this register is losing the battery. And I think you saw the expressions for power. Let me write down the, the three expressions that you uh, have seen and hopefully remember. The expression I like to start out with is a power as a current times a voltage. That's the power output of the battery. And uh, this is kind of, uh, so, you know, charge times a voltage gives you energy. The current gives you the number of charge per second. So it gives you amount of energy per second. That's why this expression gives you power. And once you have that expression, then you can uh, rewrite in two different ways to obtain these two uh, other expressions. And what I'm using here is Ohm's law, which says that current is, um, <laughs> why am I forgetting Ohm's law? <laughs> Voltage divided by resistance. <laughs> so um, you can use this to eliminate current from that expression then you get power dissipated is a voltage squared divided by R. Or you can use this same expression to eliminate voltage. You solve it for V0 and plug it in, and you get an expression that looks like I squared R. And this is the expression that I find the most useful. I guess the... Um, it's more of a personal preference. And the reason I prefer this expression is it makes you think about this particular component. It's uh, usually very difficult to make mistakes about how much current flows through a particular component. And so, you know, you figure out the current and you use the parameter that's associated with the component. I guess with this simple circuit, maybe you also can imagine how else could you make a mistake? But imagine a slightly more complicated circuit that maybe looks like um, a series register circuit. So instead of a single register there, I have uh, one register there and another register R2 here. Then you can, I hope you can imagine that if I'm using this expression, I might use register value for one, but then use the voltage value for the battery, which would be wrong because uh, really for this expression to be valid, what it should be the voltage across the register alone squared divided by R. So if I figured out what is my voltage across this register and use that value to do the calculation, then sure, that's correct. But um, that, that's where people make mistakes. And I prefer to do things in a way where uh, chances of mistakes are eliminated. So, I mean, <laughs> if it can be eliminated. <laughs> so so uh, for most of this lecture, I'll be almost uh, exclusively be using this expression. Power dissipated in a component is 
I squared the R. And yeah, so let me just start from there. <laughs> so, so this is a review of uh, a power dissipated in, um, in circuits, in DC circuits, I guess, technically. Because, well, in DC circuits, I mean, you know, it, it doesn't have to be DC. Uh, this could be a function of time, which would mean the current is function of time. And, you know, if I say, all right, my current is a function of time. And um, um, so my power dissipated will be function of time. And this gives me my instantaneous power. All of that will be fine. So um, I guess uh, what I really mean to say is not necessarily DC circuit, but <laughs> maybe a more correct way to say it is register only circuit. Um, things get more interesting when you don't have when you have uh, more than just the registers. And when I talk about um, AC circuits, there are, are really two two parts that make a circuit AC circuit um, and need AC circuit analysis methods. Um, one is the the voltage source. So let me just try to do this uh, side by side here. So, so let me do this side by side and let me try to outline power, what elements go into power dissipated in AC circuits. So power dissipated in AC circuits. Um, the first thing is you need an AC power source. So what I mean by AC power source is a sinusoidal and it can be a voltage or current source, but let me make it a voltage source since that's most common. So I need some kind of power source that's going to be time dependent in a very specific way. Specifically, it's sinusoidal. So um, I guess if I'm eschewing complex numbers, I would say it's uh, V naught times the cosine of omega t with major, maybe a phase factor if I want something completely general. Uh, I am using complex numbers uh, if you haven't seen that part in the lecture yet, please do watch it. <laughs> and I'm just gonna say my uh, power source being represented with the complex numbers is going to be V naught times E to the I omega T. And if I want a phase factor, I can say this plus V, but um, I'll, I'll just say, I send my phase in such a way that my power source has uh, starts out as at um, at time equals zero, it has a uh, voltage for enough. Um, and if you want, so, you know, with the complex numbers, the thing that um, so puzzling to initiate is, um, sorry, let me redo this, <laughs> I omega t. Uh, thing that's puzzling to initiate is, um, what does what do those imaginary numbers mean? Um, like, what do you do with those? Because uh, I thought imaginary numbers are, you know, imaginary. It has nothing to do with the real world. That's not quite right. But for the purpose of AC circuit, we can have this informal agreement that whenever we need to compare something to real numbers, I just take the real part of whatever quantity it is that I have. So, and there will be context later where the complex part has a very specific meaning and you don't want to get rid of it. So, uh, haphazard way, but um, that's not physics 4B. So um, in physics 4B, whenever we are using complex numbers, an agreement to, that we have is that if we ever need to compare it to uh, real measurements, we just take the real part. The, the, comp the imaginary part that takes all along, it helps us with the certain kinds of calculation. It's a, it's a, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna sounds, uh, I hope it sounds like I'm repeating a theme. The complex number that we introduce is a computational tool. It's some that thing that's convenient for the purpose of calculation. And if you're hearing some repeated theme, you will see later in a future class that the complex part has real physical meaning. You can't just ignore it. So, um, so AC circuit, it needs AC voltage source. That's uh, the one thing that makes it. And technically I can have this connected to just the register. And um, I mean, you know, that 
but nothing stops me from doing that. But um, this is not very interesting because uh, if all I have is have a connector to register, then the current that flows through this circuit, that's gonna be all right, Ohm's law still applies. So it's gonna be voltage divided by R. So it's gonna be V naught over R, E to the I omega T and um, Oh, you know, I guess some things are actually interesting. Uh, let me write out some things uh, in this context. So I was going to dismiss this as being utterly boring, but I see one interesting thing. So I think it's useful in some way. <laughs> so, um, and, and then I'll, we will complex it up a little bit. Um, the part that I find uh, you, I think it will be useful to you is developing uh, analogs of the expressions that we had before. So before we had this expression for power generated by the, uh, by the, by the battery. So in this circuit, you have some current flowing through the register. So there's gonna be power dissipated and so, so, you know, let me just try writing down an expression that's similar to what I had before. So I'm used to saying, all right, power dissipated as a function of time. It's going to be, um, let's going to be um, um, the current times the voltage. So uh, let me just try doing that with this. I think I'm going to get something which, um, We'll have some news, and then um, and then we'll take it up from there. Let's see. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna take a little bit longer time than I normally do to validate some of the expressions that I wrote down. But you know, those are my mathematical expressions. So let me copy those over and write them down. I have a V naught over R. Um, e to the i omega t, that's my current as a function of time. I have V naught, e to the i omega t, all right? And uh, all right, let me just do the algebra. I get V naught squared over R. All right, uh, that's kind of looking like that. Um, and I have to take care of the exponentials. Uh, when exponentials multiply the exponential algebra, I can add the argument. So it's gonna be e to the i two omega t, huh? Double the frequency. All right. Um, so this is what the expression says my uh, power is, and or as a complex quantity. And what I was saying we should agree on as we are using these complex functions and numbers is that. So let's say I just want you to measure my real power then I imagine taking the real part of all this expression. The Euler's formula is this, as a reminder, e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. This is the only part that's complex. So when I take the real part of that, I am going to get v naught squared over r times just uh, this part. So cosine of to omega t. And uh, let's see if that expression makes a sense. Um, here in might, and <laughs> that worries me a little bit because um, it's not illustrating one of the things you need to worry about when you're dealing with the complex numbers, but that's fine. It's, I think uh, it's a hazard of dealing with um, oscillatory functions. It hides some certain features. So, um, so I'm going to plot some things to make sure that I'm not making any mistake. This is what I mean by I want to validate the expressions I'm writing down. And one of the features that I see, oops, um, one of the features that I see arising here right now is that my voltage was at the frequency of omega or you know, frequency that's associated with omega, so whatever. I'm gonna be, yeah. Um, that was my applied uh, frequency. My power oscillates at the frequency two omega. 
I just want to make sure that that is what I would expect. So I'm just uh, plotting in this mini plot here, um, the voltage that I'm applying as a function of time. So it's not like a cosine of omega t. So it will look something like this. Let me just do one and a half cycles or so. So that's my voltage. And as I'm applying the voltage, uh, it's gonna be induced through the circuit. And in the case of um, just a simple register, uh, which is the reason I was saying it was boring, the current and voltage are in sync. They, are, they have the same phase. So current will be at some other scale that comes from dividing by V by R. Um, and it's gonna look exactly the same. When voltage is zero, current is zero. When voltage is maximum, current is maximum, zero, maximum. So the current will also look like some kind of cosine. And the power should be given by one cosine form times another cosine form. And uh -huh, I, I see. So I see one part that's working out the, um, that's illustrating something. And another part that uh, will be telling you that this expression is actually wrong. So let me just show you that this does lead to a frequency doubling. Because when I multiply two cosine things, then, wait, does it even? Yeah, yeah, it, it leads to frequency doubling, mainly from this portion here. When a negative quantity multiplies to negative, then for the product of I times V, so on the positive part, it's the, kind of the same thing here. And, but on the negative part, negative times negative, it shows something positive. Should look, so the product of I times V should look something like this. So there is an actual frequency doubling. Um, and uh, this part where it crosses zero and you square it, doesn't look quite linear, it looks like. So you can do the detailed math. So it is true that there is, that part is totally right. Now, um, here's a part that, um, that um, tells you that this expression is wrong, which is um, imagine looking at average power. So, so here, you know, with the expressions with current, for example, if you look at average current, average current will turn out to be zero. And I, I hope you are not surprised that average current flow in an AC circuit is zero. It's alternating current, it alternates, like it adds up to zero. I hope it makes sense. But um, so I did this graph very carefully. The um, uh, graph I drew for power, it's drawn very carefully. It's not wrong in any way. And you can see that when you imagine taking an average of that, it's not gonna be a zero average power dissipated. And I hope that's consistent with your intuition for how these things should work. In fact, I think this might be one of your conceptual questions. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, um, so average power here isn't zero. In fact, the average power here, if you took care to actually figure it out, it's gonna be at the midpoint between this. So this is gonna be the, the average of I times V, you know, take the average, that's what it'll be. Now you look at this expression and I hope it worries you <laughs> that uh, average of a cosine of two omega t over a, let's say a period that corresponds to two omega, it's gonna be zero because um, cosine averages to zero. And um, in fact, if you, um, so, you know, the, the expression that's here, this is coming from uh, basically something that looks like a cosine squared omega t. And if you are skilled in trigonometry and you remember all your trig identities and there's a, something called the power reducing formula. And um, you, so if you know, remember all this stuff <laughs> and from your, one of your power reducing formulas, you might remember <laughs> that this is equal, not equal to cosine of two omega t, that's in the mix, but this is equal to one minus cosine of two omega t divided by two, I think. Did I remember it correctly? 
Uh, let me just quickly do this in my head. <laughs> you know what? I can't do it in my head while I'm on camera. So cosine of 2 omega t is equal to cosine squared omega t minus the sine squared omega t. So uh, 1 minus. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, it's one plus cosine of two omega t. Because then when I add it, I have cosine squared omega t, and one minus sine squared omega t is cosine squared omega t. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so, anyways, you might remember this. And in fact, this average is coming from this portion here, one half. And as you're taking average, this cosine of two omega t goes to zero, disappears. So, yeah. And, this actually is revealing one of the things we have to be careful about whenever you are using um, complex numbers. I think I do mention this in the lectures. Um, I don't know how much emphasis I place on it. Um, it's uh, basically the things you should be mindful of when you are using uh, complex numbers or complex functions to help you with the calculation. So, there are things that are okay to do with the complex numbers. Um, so for example, uh, so let me just say uh, things okay uh, with uh, complex numbers. So things like addition, subtraction, derivatives, um, integrals, even scalar multiplication are all okay. And um, I guess, should I? Well, let me go in. Uh, should I go through the justification of it? Uh, let me not go into the, the detailed justification of it. Um, what this represent are linear. Um, I think that's something that you will get a more detailed definition of when you take linear algebra covered in math uh, 3E. <laughs> so <laughs> let me just leave that there. These are all linear operations, even taking derivatives and integrals. And with these linear operations, certain relationship between the real and the imaginary parts of a complex number is preserved or they are transformed in a predictable, nice way that later on you can do things like taking the real part and get a number that you would have gotten if you didn't use complex number. So these are all okay things. It's quite a few, which is why using complex number is um, it's good thing to do in AT circuit analysis. But what you have to be aware of is that there are things um, not okay with complex numbers. That certain operations that if you do, um, you are going to mess up the relationships and, um, and then you will get a result like this, which is not actually correct. I mean, got some aspects of it correct, but it missed this whole uh, offset that should have gotten, you should have gotten. And um, I guess I can list the two of them, which is function multiplication and the other you can kind of guess function division. Division is kind of a, you know, <laughs> a kind of multiplication. So these things are, um, they will mess up certain things that are set up in a complex number. And these are examples of, the, of things that are not, not linear operation. You can kind of get that, you know, if you have a function that's a function of x and um, a function of x, let's say x. And if you do any of these, then this function will remain in the order of x. But if you do things like multiplication, then you get x squared. That's where it doesn't look linear. <laughs> um, uh, I will let math three do more detailed, mathematically proper uh, discussion of what linearity means and why function multiplication is, is uh, does not preserve linearity. So. And here's a illustration of how uh, this can go wrong. Uh, imagine you have a function, um, a complex function f um, with the real parameter t as an input. So it's a complex 
Technically, I could do it this way. I could uh, represent it with the real part plus the complex part or imaginary part, technically. And I, so for the purpose of this illustration, uh, if there's a second complex function, which also has a real part and an imaginary part, sometimes you know do, doing this uh, separation can be very complex, but um, imagine that it can be done in principle. Then, then in playing with these is where you can see what I mean by these are linear operations. If you do any of these, the real part and the imaginary part will stay separated. Uh, no amount of addition, subtraction, derivatives, integrals. Scalar multiplication is a tricky one because that can actually mix uh, the complex and the, or imaginary and the real part. So this is a, let me just point that out as somewhat more complicated one. So you can, and let's see for one through four, how they are linear and how if, uh, you know, you took these complex functions, the addition, subtraction, derivatives or integrals, and then just took the real part, then you can swap that order of operation and everything will be fine. But let me try doing function multiplication to show you how that all goes wrong. So when you do function multiplication, this is what you get. So multiply complex function t with complex function t, complex function f with complex function g. And, um, so you know this this is the full algebra. You have to write out the whole thing, and um, you have to, there are potentially four terms here that I will get from this multiplication. Let me just uh, try to quickly write them all out as quickly as I can, plus I G a complex part or imaginary part. Sorry, I tended to use complex as a synonym of imaginary and that's not technically right. So let me, I'm, you know, I just uh, need to write out these terms, you know, G times uh, or F times G. So that's one term here, F R times G R. That's fine. That's one of the terms you know I would have gotten uh, as I'm as I'm doing just the regular real function multiplication. So I expect you to see this. That's perfectly fine. And uh, let me do f r times uh, i g uh, complex. Then let me try to separate this uh, as I'm writing the terms. So I'm going to write the terms with the imaginary i in um, in separately here. So I get FR times G complex. And the mixing of this concerns me a little, but you know what? It's in the imaginary part. Imaginary part, I'm gonna throw it away later anyway. So maybe I don't care. Okay, let me keep going. Uh, I have IF complex times GR. So it has a factor of I again. And I get, uh, so plus F complex times GR and you know, both the functions of time. And it's in the imaginary part that I'm gonna throw it away later. So maybe it's fine. It's actually not fine, but maybe I'll say it's fine. And this final term is what gives me trouble. I have I FC times I GC, I squared is minus one. So I get this minus F complex times G complex. So it's this term here that makes multiplication not work. So when I did uh, this multiplication, there is uh, this term that came from the, that imaginary part multiplying with the imaginary part that basically changed my real part from what it would have been without the imaginary part. So yeah, so function multiplication, um, not kosher, <laughs> not, not okay thing to do when you are working with a complex number. There may be a very limited set of circumstances where you can, and scalar multiplication might be considered one of those. But um, in general, if you are multiplying a complex function with another complex function, um, you better know what it is you're doing.
<laughs> so going back here, so then how is using complex number in any way useful? I mean, you know, this problem is not a complicated problem. Uh, I'm just simply calculating power and doing with just the register. I haven't even introduced the capacitors and inductors yet. So if I can sim if I can do something as simple as comp computing power uh, with just to register circuit with the first, so you know, if I had done this, you know, turn current into real part, the voltage into real part, and did a calculation that way, then you know, I would have been fine. But that seems like I then you know might as well just uh, deal with the, the trigonometric functions. Why go through the trouble of uh, deal, uh, introducing complex numbers? So there are certain circumstances where I really want to multiply functions together, and if I can't do that, then it feels like you know it's not worth using complex numbers. So so let me show you what you can still get out of here. As while using complex numbers. So there's a very specific way in which you can do multiplication to give you a very specific quantity. And you can do this multiplication in a very easy way. So you might have noticed that as I was talking about this calculation here, where I made sure everything to do with just the real function so that it's all correct. I was very quick to get to the average quantity here. And there's really two reasons. One is that average is really simple. It's constant quantity. It's easy, nice, good to work with. <laughs> That's one. It, if it's easy and nice, I'm going to consider using it. And two is a lot of times you're actually interested in the average quantity. Uh, imagine like a power in your house. You know, it's a 60 hertz AC circuit, but um, you don't really care about, about the 60 hertz oscillation or I guess 120 hertz oscillation in power usage. In, at the end of the day, what you really care about is either total energy used or very closely related to total energy used. You are interested in average power consumption. So there are circumstances where um, what you really want, so, so I want to make sure I limit myself properly, that I'm not talking about a generic circumstance where you might want to multiply two complex functions together. Um, because if that's what you want to do, there isn't a general solution for that. That's just a limitation of using complex numbers. But you might have a circumstance in which where, let's say, if you have a complex uh, function f and you have a complex function g and um, so you know they, they represent uh, oscillatory quantities like this you know let me use the letters i'm already using let's say you are interested in um, so both of these the v and i they have their real counterpart so you know the real counterparts v and i let's say you are not necessarily interested in their, um, their direct product. With real functions, you can calculate it, but let's say you don't really want that. What you really want is the average of this product, as in um, the definition of the this average, or um, I guess I had to say, you want, the, uh, you want time average. So you know it's a function of time, and you want this product uh, that's been averaged over time. So the the precise mathematical definition of that average would be first to integrate that uh, product as a function of time from zero to some big time t. That's many multiples of the um, many multiples of the period. And then you divide it by one over t. Uh, this is all the summing up of the contributions and then dividing it by t gives you the average. Let's, uh, let's say you are, um, that's the, really the quantity that you are interested in. And uh, you can see from the calculation that I did here that uh, that average is actually pretty simple. 
because this cosine term, in the average, it's just going to get averaged out. If a t happens to be exactly one period or multi integer multiple of a period, it becomes exactly that. But if a t is a simply a quantity that's much larger than a period, then you can argue through how you know the integral of cosine omega t over the time period is uh, you know some number between minus one and one, and when you divide it by one over t, becomes vanishingly small for t going to infinity. So. So really the only term that doesn't vanish is one over two. The integral gives a factor of t that gets canceled out and the average simply becomes the magnitudes of v naught times i naught divided by two. And since the result with the real number is so simple, um, I you know, watching that, I hope you hope <laughs> that there's a way to do an equivalent calculation using purely complex num complex functions without ever referring to the the real version of it. And there is, and this is how you do that calculation. You do the calculation by um, by doing this. One of the functions you are going to need to take a complex conjugate. So let me erase all of them. So if you compute this quantity specifically, so uh, let me choose current to, to take the complex conjugate of. So, so the, for the current complex function, I'm going to be dealing with the complex conjugate. And uh, as a quick review reminder, this is uh, what I mean by complex conjugate. So let's say I have some complex number, uh, or let's say I have this. Um, and I want the complex conjugate of this quantity. To obtain complex conjugate, all you do is take the imaginary i and change it with the minus i. So this complex conjugate here would be e to the minus i theta, where theta is a real parameter. If theta is not, then that gets con conjugate sign too. Or splitting it out like this, it becomes cosine of theta minus i sine theta. Once again, if uh, I can treat theta as a real parameter. If it's complex parameter, then <laughs> it gets its own conjugate sign too. Um, so I have a i, the complex con or i star, the complex conjugate of the current function. Let me multiply that with the voltage, the complex function. When I do this product, this product is going to be, and I showed you specifically for this example that it is, and a claim I will make without proving, because proving it takes time, is that it's generally true whenever your complex functions are um, um, oscillatory in time like this. And what's generally true is, um, so this product will be equal to twice the time average of the product of the real version of these functions. So you saw me write down this time average before. This was equal to the magnitudes divided by two. That was the time average. You saw it in the graphical form here, and you saw the, the algebraic version just a couple minutes ago. So. So I guess what I'm claiming with this statement here is when I do this product, it better come out to I naught times V naught. And let's see if it does. Um, let me write this portion out explicitly. So the I complex conjugate is gonna be this, or uh, let me, for the sake of simplicity here, let me just uh, replace this with the I naught. I mean, I know what it is in terms of V naught and R, but Let's say I naught. So it's going to be I naught times e to the minus I omega t times <laughs> um, V naught times e to the I omega t. And when you do this product, you know, do the exponential algebra, you get I naught times V naught. And oh, yeah, that's what I said I was going to get. So, so in this uh, specific example, it or, Okay, and the claim I'm making is that this is gonna be generally true 
whenever these are oscillatory functions of time like this. Then I guess if you're like me, I'm a bit of a, a contrarian. And whenever someone claims something, the very first thing I do is I think of counterexamples. <laughs> and that's what, what was distracting me. What was distracting me which, uh, is a case which is not true in this case, but it's something that could be true in a different case. What if it's I naught e to the I two omega t? What if there was something that was forcing the current to somehow have double the frequency of voltage? Then um, I guess a <laughs> bit of a problem here. Is that, so when you do that calculation, I think um, you are going to get a number that um, it's not technically real. Um, it is complex. I think if you do another time average with that, like if you do another time average, then it will fix the issue that I'm going to point out. So, you know, it, you will end up with this quantity here, uh, e to the minus i omega t. And if you were to do a time average, then the time average will actually turn out to be zero. And zero is actually physically correct answer. It turns out if this uh, has a double the frequency, then um, some of the time you are dissipating positive power, some of the time you are dissipating negative power, which technically should mean power input, and those average out to zero. Um, but if you don't average, then you have this complex number. And um, yeah, so let me not worry about that. Um, I think uh, make a more limited version of the claim that I think I was trying to make here, which would be. <laughs> <laughs> so I think let, let me limit my claim here so that later on you don't find a counterexample where uh, you find what I'm saying is wrong. So let me just, because uh, uh, I think I can limit my claim and still make it be useful for our purposes here. So the limited version of claim will be this, uh, where you are dealing with only a single function. So, so, you know, with a single function, you still have the same problem that I was pointing out about how you can't multiply a complex function to another complex function. So if you have, um, let's say, complex voltage source T, then um, what should you get with taking the real part of the complex function squared, what you get here is different from what should you get if you took the real part and then squared what you got there. That's different. Uh, just to do basically the exact same calculation I did before. Um, it's not the same. And, um, and with this limited context, this is the claim that I can make. Um, so, so, you know, even with a, just a single function, you have trouble multiplying the function to itself. Um, you can, yeah, but again, if uh, the context is that maybe I'm not interested in the square of the function itself. So, you know, if that's what I'm interested in, I'm kind of, uh, or I guess not this. Um, so if uh, what I mean, so if, if uh, what I'm interested, so this is the real version of the function. If uh, what I'm interested in is the, square of the function itself, um, as in what we would get if I had a V naught squared over R uh, cosine, or you know, that, so I guess that's cosine squared omega T. So if this actual function of time is what I'm interested in, then, um, sorry, complex functions can help you get there correctly. But let's say I'm not actually interested in that. What I'm interested in is just an average over time or, you know, just writing out explicitly, just one over t integral from zero to t over v of t squared dt. If that's what you're interested in, then the complex functions can help you get there because I can say without any um, hesitation or counter examples that work out that this quantity here is gonna be equal to the quantity that I'm writing on the left-hand side. The complex function multiplied to complex conjugate of that function 
divided by two. And you can see with the example I have up there, if I do this calculation, then um, so this is what it looks like. Kind of the same thing I did uh, up uh, before with the V naught e to the minus i omega t times V naught e to the i omega t. It's the same calculation I did before. Um, divided by two, so it's a V naught squared over two e to the minus i omega t cancels out with the e omega t. The difference from what I did before is that um, because it's the same function to itself, there is no possibility of these two frequencies being different. So this uh, complex uh, factor is uh, guaranteed to cancel out. Um, and, and, and this is equal to the time average um, that you can get if we, you calculated that. And it, it, so, so, and if you, Imagine taking this, multiplying by one over R, that will give you the average power dissipated. So there is a way to get to average power dissipated in AC circuit that uses only complex functions and very simple operations using complex functions only. So never dealing with, um, never dealing with anything more complicated than um, complex conjugate operation, which is just replacing i with a minus i, and simple products of complex numbers that uh, can be worked out relatively simply algebraically. So this expression is what I'm going to be utilizing. Uh, in fact, uh, probably the current version of that, because as I was saying at the beginning, uh, what I prefer whenever I'm calculating power is to use this expression. And one upside here is that it's a function of, uh, or it depends on single function of time only, i of t. And uh, um, so, so it looks like it's going to work out. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, so maybe I should do a couple examples. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, this was uh, uh, what I was starting out as a power dissipated in AC circuit. And I guess technically it's AC circuit, but it's a AC circuit that um, doesn't have all the interesting features of uh, AC circuit because it's just register only. Um, the time dependence of current is exactly the same as time dependence of voltage. So, um, I mean, okay, so there's time dependence and it's a good practice to introduce operations with these new mathematical things. And after having done that, it's not quite an interesting setup because just register. What makes the AC circuit interesting is um, it's what earlier made the time dependent circuit time dependent, capacitors and inductors. Those circuit elements by their definition always, in, always involve some kind of time um, dependent things, you know, integral with respect to time or derivative with respect to time. So before when we were trying to apply DC voltage, those elements introduce the time dependence. And with the AC circuit, where there's a sinusoidally driven power source, those components will also introduce interesting phenomena. 